in true pure and hard style. If you're ready for a word, let me see it in the chats. If you are ready for a word, type word. If you are ready for a word, type word. I need to see the words going up. Hallelujah. It is so beautiful and timely how we get to flow from the series that Rev. Cardin and myself did in March, Back to Basics series, right into Easter. Right, flowing from back to basics, right into Easter. This is a season when we remember the core of our salvation, when the price was paid for our redemption. This is a season where we highlight the act of redemption that was done, that was perfect, can never be done again, that was done by Jesus, where we were brought, bought with a price, basically. Right, we were bought with a price. In that transaction, God used Jesus as currency to purchase our redemption, to purchase our salvation. So in this season, we reflect. It's a season where we usually reflect on his, his suffering, the crucifixion, the burial, and the resurrection. That's what Easter is usually centered around, just highlighting those aspects of the redemption. And as it relates to his suffering and crucifixion, I was thinking about it and just how graphic it can be when you really read the Bible and when you, when you try to imagine it. And persons have tried to replicate that image, right? Replicate that scene via different movies. I believe the latest one was Passion of the Christ and you've had some older movies before. And no matter how much technology is used, no matter how much of a great actor or actress are used, the actual act that was done cannot compare. The actual act that was done cannot compare. Hallelujah. His suffering, I was reading upon it over the weekend and just while preparing for this word, his suffering where before the cross, where he was arrested wrongfully. He was arrested wrongfully. He was spat on, person spat on him. Right? He was beaten. He was flogged. Having a crown of thorns placed on his head. And forgive me, but I didn't notice this part. Even when the crown of thorns were placed on his head, the word said that they beat him. They beat him on the head with the, while, those crown, while that crown of thorns was on his head. So, they already disrespect him. They already beat him. And then on top of that, they place a crown of thorns on his head. And while that was on his head, they beat that crown of thorns on top of it. Mighty God, repeatedly, repeatedly, just continuously beating. So the suffering was definitely there. And then from that transitioning to the cross, where he was nailed to the cross, hands and feet. And then being lifted while that weight of his body is just hanging on those very nails. The suffering of just hanging there for hours upon hours bearing all that agony, all that pain until he took his final breath. People of God, this is not something we take for granted. God, be, sorry, God bared it all for us. Now, what stood out is that while the crucifixion, which brought suffering and the death and burial had to take place, the act of redemption was not complete. The act of redemption was not complete. Today, being Resurrection Sunday, is when we reflect specifically on the final stage, the final act of that redemption, his resurrection. Amen? And I want us to zone in on this passage of scripture, which explains why his resurrection was necessary, why his resurrection had to take place. And it comes to us from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 15. And bear with me, this is the amplified version. I know we're used to the NIV, but this is the amplified version, which just gives it a little more explanation. So Hebrews 2, verses 14 to 15 reads, Therefore, since these, his children, share in flesh and blood the physical nature of mankind, he himself in a similar manner also shared in the same physical nature but without sin. So that through experiencing death, he might make powerless, ineffective, impotent, him who had the power of death. 
that is the devil himself and that he might free all those who through the haunting fear of death were held in slavery throughout their lives and so that he might free all those who through the haunting fear of death were held in slavery throughout their lives the resurrection is a critical aspect of the entire equation because the suffering alone could not have saved us the crucifixion alone could not have saved us him dying alone the death alone could not have saved us death had to be conquered death had to be defeated and our theme this morning is death conquered living a resurrected life i know that's a little long but i want you guys to type that in the chats this morning the theme for this morning is death conquered living a resurrected life hallelujah the theme alone in itself is so powerful and I, I promise you that this is a powerful word in this season i am believing that this word is just a reminder for us as believers what that power does for us walking in him right and for it, i believe it's a message i'm declaring that it is a message of rescue for unbelievers this morning i can truly say that i'm actually hungry and passionate for souls this morning i want the souls to be one this morning so pure in hearters i need your help during this message just continue encouraging the unbelievers because we are believing god this morning resurrection sunday that souls are going to be resurrected that souls are going to be one for the kingdom of god amen and amen as highlighted in our back to basic series in the first week and if you weren't a part of it trust me you missed something but don't worry i'm sure i'll catch up somewhere or somehow right but in the first week we touched on our identity in christ our identity in christ and in that we highlighted god's intention for man at the beginning right what he intended for us to be who, in who he intended for us to be and that was for us to live a long life death was not a part of it right god intended for us to have dominion and just live in righteousness just think about that his intention was just perfection was perfect peace but then it was interrupted it was interrupted by the devil who introduced sin and death the devil brought sin and death into the picture now the devil had the power of death as highlighted in the scripture before death was of him the word says that the wages of sin is death now death was introduced the devil introduced sin and in extension death right so the wages of sin is death but despite that disruption from the devil god's perfect plan had to be fulfilled this was no surprise to god i am sure right he's a god of all he's the alpha and the omega and i am sure that he would have allowed it so that he can prove to us that he is truly the king of kings so god had to create a way for us to be restored he had to create a way for his original plan to be regained he had to create a way for salvation all power had to be reclaimed and this had to happen in the natural don't miss that this had to take place in the natural so the scripture says hebrews 2 verses 14 to 15 the part of it that says since these his children share in flesh and blood the physical nature of mankind he himself in a similar manner also shared in the same physical nature both without sin so that so that experiencing death he might make powerless him who had the power of death so in order for death to be conquered in order for the devil to be defeated this had to happen in the natural amen now this is supported by first corinthians 15 verse 21 first corinthians 15 verse 21 and this is niv which reads for since death came through a man the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man for as, in, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. I'll read that again. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. 
For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Sorry, the power of sin and death was broken. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the power and sin, the power of sin and death was broken. Death alone was not enough because if death alone was the final stage, the enemy would have won. The enemy would have won because he had the power over death. He controlled that, right? And so God had to defeat that. God had to take that away. God, to, God had to have all power. So death alone could not, be the, could not be the final stage. So while it had to happen, while it was a part of it, while it was necessary, because in order for something to be resurrected, it has to die, right? So while it was necessary, it was not final. Type that in the chat for me, please. Death was not final. Death was not final. Even us as believers, as we are representing Christ, as we stand as ambassadors for God, we can't just refer to his death alone and leave it there. We can't just refer to the death alone and leave it there. We have to highlight the fact that death was defeated. We have to highlight the fact that the grave was conquered. We have to highlight his resurrection. Death alone couldn't have saved us. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 17 says, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Hallelujah. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Death had to be conquered. Jesus had to be resurrected for full power, for the full power of resurrection to take place, for our sins to be, to, 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 to be gone, for our souls to be saved, for salvation to occur, for redemption to occur. Hallelujah. And so in the resurrection, we see the full and magnificent glory of God. We see death being conquered. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? The grave has no victory over us. The grave has no victory over Jesus Christ. Oh, death, where is your sting? Hallelujah. 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 And just by that alone, we can see that there is power in the resurrection. There is power in the resurrection. Paul put it like this in Philippians 3 verse 10 to 11. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and, to par and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. To know Christ is to know the power of his resurrection. To know Christ is to know the power of his resurrection. Now, as believers, as we've said, there is power in his resurrection, right? His, re his resurrection freed us from sin. His resurrection made us whole. His, re his resurrection conquered death and defeated the grave. And his resurrection gave us access to eternal life. According to his word, John 11 verse 25, it says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live eternally. Hallelujah. His resurrection gave us access to eternal life. Now, Jesus paid it all. And if through death and resurrection and the belief that we have in that, we also rose with him, we are living in the power of his resurrection. Just the very belief in that alone, the, the belief in the price that was paid and how it was paid and every aspect of it, the crucifixion, the death, the burial, and the resurrection, if we believe in that, then we are also rose with him and we are living in the power of his resurrection. We, won't, we, we aren't going to live. We are living in the power of his resurrection. His death and resurrection was an historical event. Like this thing happened in the natural over 2,000 years ago, many, many years ago, right? And it cannot be repeated. It was a one-time act. It was a one-time act. And to think that that one-time act happened in the natural 
and the freedom, the access it gave us to salvation in the spiritual realm is powerful. Up until this day, that's why we are still pushing together as a ministry to win souls for the kingdom because the resurrection power still stands. Unbelievers have access to this power from that one time act that was done. Glory to your name, Jesus. It was perfect. It was perfect. Hallelujah. So we have to honestly ask ourselves in our day to day walk, when persons look at us, when they see us move, when they see us interact, when they hear us speak, is the resurrection power reflected on us? Is his resurrection on display in our lives? When we walk, do people see a reflection of what the resurrection did? Hallelujah. These are questions we have to ask. And this is not for bashing or anything like that. This is really to encourage us in the kingdom of God and so we can move even stronger into his calling on our lives. Amen? Romans 6 verse 4 says, We are therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that Jesus, in order that just as Jesus was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Let me read that again. Romans 6 verse 4. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Jesus was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. That's the point I want to highlight, that last part. We too may live a new life. A new life is a resurrected life. Are we living a new life today? Are we living a resurrected life as believers this morning? Hallelujah. Now, what I want to do is take you through some points that highlights what a resurrected life looks like. In order for us to answer those questions, we have to really observe and assess these points. What a resurrected life looks like. A resurrected life is one, a life of freedom. A resurrected life is a life of freedom. As a believer, Living and walking in the power of the resurrection, you are free. You are free. When Jesus rose from the grave, he was free. There was nothing tied to him. There was nothing holding him back. Nothing could have stopped him. He was free. There, no chains could hold him, right? No bondage could hold him. No demon could hold him. The stone that they put in front of the grave, that could not hold him. The guard that they put there to stay and make sure same no move or make sure resurrection doesn't happen, that could not hold him. Demons could not hold him. Satan and all his kingdom of darkness could not hold him. He was free. Now because of the power in that, it is the same for us as believers. Where no chains can hold us. No chains can hold us. No situation can get us down. No plan of the enemy, no act of the enemy, none of his attacks, no weapon can hold us down. We must walk in freedom. I am encouraging your pure in hearters. I'm encouraging our un uh, believers. I'm encouraging our even unbelievers walk, step into that resurrection life because it has freedom. Hallelujah. Galatians 5 verse 1 says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Do not allow yourselves to be burdened again, which means that we were burdened before, which means that walking into freedom, all that burden should just fly, um, drop off of us. We cannot step into a resurrected life and still have the burdens, still be moving, having, having burdens again upon us having the yoke of slavery up on us. If you are free, then you are free indeed. Amen? We sing the songs all the time. We sing the songs all the time. Believe me, we have the song them pat. Right? We have the song them pat. The words are there. If you're old school, you would say that, I am free, I am free. Praise the Lord, I am free. No longer bound. <laughs> 
I wish I could sing it. No more chains holding me. Hallelujah. My soul is resting. It's such a blessing. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I am free. And if you're new school, like we pure in heart, as we say, freedom, freedom, no more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage. I am free. Hallelujah. We have it. It is there in the songs. But does our lives really reflect that freedom? I promise you that after the first and last, now go hear me try to sing. Right? After the first and the last. Does our lives really reflect that freedom? The word refers to being burdened again. So we were once bound by many things. Now, I'm not a big believer in going back to the past or dwelling on the past. But if we pause as believers to reflect on where we could have been, what we could have been in the situations we could have been in, the people we could have been messed up with, the circles we could have been associated with, right? We would see that we were really bound and wrapped up in sin. We weren't free, right? A lot of us struggled with different types of sin. There's pornography. There's other sexual immoralities, right? There's fornication, there's lust. And some of us, we like to classify big sin and little sin. Big sin and little sin. And if you look at lies, unforgiveness, just the fact of allowing fear to take control of us and living by fear, worry, anger, insecurity, low self-esteem, these were all graves for us. These all represented graves for us. Now the fact is that Christ did the priceless act of conquering the grave and making us free from the grave. But sometimes as, as Christians, we keep going back to the grave. We keep going back to the grave, to the very same graves that Jesus conquered for us. And we aren't walking in a life of freedom. We aren't living a resurrected life. And sometimes, I love how Prophet put it on Friday, like this was, this was confirmation for me. Sometimes it's what we classify as the small things. Sometimes that's what kicks us off of our feet, right? It's what we classify as the small things. Prophet said that one thing, that one thing. So we might not be struggling with, quote unquote, the big sin like pornography and fornication, but it is the worry, it is the fear, it is a question of self-worth that block us from truly being free. Those are graves also, and Christ has made us free from those also in the name of Jesus. So I'm reminding you this morning, pure in hearters, that through the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, you have been made totally free. So walk in freedom. John 8 verses 36 says, so if the son makes you free, then you are unquestionably, I like that word, you are unquestionably free, which means that there is no doubt about it. You are free. If the son makes you free, if Jesus makes you free through the price that, you, that he paid, then you are free indeed. You are unquestionably free. So you are no longer held in captivity. You are no longer burdened. You are totally free. Hallelujah. Type it in the chat room, please. I am free. I am free. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for freedom. Hallelujah. So a resurrected life is a life of freedom. Number two, a resurrected life is a life of faith. Come on. A resurrected life is a life of faith. Like this is, this is, we would say that this is obvious, right? Or this is a given because our very own salvation is based on faith. Our very own salvation is based on on faith. It is through faith that we stand and believe in what he did, the price that he paid, the fact that he died and rose again on the third day and made us free. That is by faith. So how can we live a resurrected life without faith? How can we live a resurrected life and not have faith? Sometimes we allow tests and trials and the magnitude of those tests and trials to determine 
the magnitude of our faith. And that's just the reality of the situation. Sometimes we allow the tests and the trials and the magnitude of those very same tests and trials to determine the magnitude of our faith in those trials. If the test is too small, then the faith big. If the test is too small, then the faith big. And if the test is too big, the faith small. Think about it. For some obvious scenarios or some obvious situations that we go through, we know that God often take me through this. Like we speak big and boldly about it with faith turn up. Right? But for those circumstances where you cannot see the way through, that is when the faith don't measure up. That is when the faith don't measure up. But I'm here to tell you this morning that Jesus himself was tempted and tested in his suffering. Hallelujah. He himself was tempted and tested in his suffering. And because he was able to overcome the test through faith in his father, he can also assist us in overcoming our trials today. Hebrews 2 verses 18 says, Because he himself in his humanity in natural form has suffered in being tempted, he is able to help and provide immediate assistance to those who are being tempted and exposed to suffering. Because he himself in his humanity has suffered in being tempted, he is able to help us and provide immediate assistance to those who are being tempted and exposed to suffering. So because Jesus conquered suffering, because in that suffering he believed in his father, he had faith in his father, and he overcame that. Think about the brutality of it all, how graphic it was, how painful it was. And in all of that, he had faith in the Father that this was the perfect work of the Father. And because he was able to do that through the resurrection power, we have access to that faith also. And we should execute that faith in our walk. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, Jesus' response to being arrested, I just want to highlight this part of the story his response in Matthew 6 26 verses 53 to 54 uh, media you don't have this and that's fine but Matthew 26 verses 53 to 54 this is when they were getting ready to arrest him and all the crowd and the excitement was beginning to, to, de to develop and Peter drew his sword and attacked and cut off the ear off of a guard right one of the guard of the high priest and Jesus replied and said, put your sword back in its place. Put your sword back in its place for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. This is the part that stands out for me. He says, do you think I cannot call on my father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. But then how would the scriptures be fulfilled? That say it must happen this way. So in the middle of all of this, God has said, look here. If my want me can call upon the Father and him just send help immediately and disrupt all of this and save me. Right? But he's saying that it's had to ha it has to happen this way. So Jesus in this response teaches us how to, how to believe and have faith in the Father in our situations. And, and what I like about it is that the level of faith is twofold. The level of faith is twofold. Think about it. The first part is he believed, he knew, he had faith in the fact that if he calls on the Father, he would respond. Jesus knew that if he called on God, he would respond and send at his disposal more than 12 legions of angels. That's one fold of the faith. But then the other is that Jesus knew that it was written. Jesus knew that it had to happen this way and he had faith in that. Jesus knew that he was just a part of God's entire plan, God's master plan. And he, di he didn't only know it, but he had faith in it. He didn't try to go against it. He didn't run away from the suffering. He didn't run away from being arrested. He didn't try to get away from being crucified because he had faith that this was God's perfect plan. How many of us can really reflect that and live by that today? In going through your situations, 
knowing that you can call on God the Father and he will send help immediately. Right? No matter what the attacks are, no matter what the suffering is, if you call on him, he will send angels to your rescue immediately. How many of us believe that? And most importantly, how many of us truly believe that even if we were meant to go through the suffering, even if it had to happen this way, our faith still stands. Because it's easy to say that, yes, I'm being fought against, or I'm going through this, and God, I'm going to send help. And you go down on your knees, and you bust tongues, and you do all sorts of something, and you fast before today. But the suffering doesn't leave. How many of us, our faith will still stand knowing that the suffering has to take place? The suffering has to take place. We have to have faith in the Father. Look at Jesus and how he had faith in him. And believe in that and live by that. The word says, Matthew 17 verse 20. Because you have, he replied, sorry, because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Now we always hear this scripture, right? I mean, I speak for myself. I always hear this scripture and just never recognize how small a mustard seed is, right? And we hear about the mustard seed faith. Well, this morning, Purin Arthas may enlighten on a darkness for those who didn't know because maybe some of them didn't know, right? This is what a mustard seed looks like. I'm hoping the camera can catch it. It is that small. I have about three of them on here, right? I have about three of them on here. This is what a mustard seed looks like. This is what I was trying to hold it with my hand, but it's that small. I don't think the camera could have zoomed in that close, right? But God is saying that if you have faith, <laughs> hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. If you have faith as small as this, you can say to the mountain, move from here to there and it will move in the name of Jesus. But then faith also has to come or be executed if that mountain doesn't move. Faith also has to be executed if that mountain does not move. Knowing that it is not supposed to move or it is not time for that mountain to move. We have to trust God in the full picture. Amen. God won't reveal everything to us, but that's where faith comes in. That's why faith is necessary, right? Faith is necessary because even with the things that we cannot see, we are trusting and knowing that it is for our good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So faith, so a life, a resurrected life is a life of freedom and a life of faith. Hallelujah. I hope you're getting it this morning, parent hearters. A resurrected life is a life of abundance. That's number three. A resurrected life is a life of abundance. John 10 verse 10 says, The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. That is a plan of the enemy. But Jesus comes so that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. Now the word abundantly here means superior. Right? Never ending. So God is saying that I have come so that you might have life at a superior level, at a high level, at a high standard. Right? never ending eternity now the enemy is out to still kill and still steal sorry kill and destroy but the resurrected life grants each of us access to a never ending life grants each of us access to eternity now as we know and we highlighted in our discipleship sessions last month that once that we are born twice 
right? The first birth is a natural birth. Amen? The first birth is a natural birth. So in the first birth, we gain access to life between our date of birth and our date of death. So in the natural, when we come into the natural, when we enter this world, we gain access to life between our date of birth and our date of death. But the second birth, which is a rec resurrected life, when we accept Jesus Christ of Nazareth as our la Lord and Savior, when we are born again, we gain access to eternal life. We gain access to eternal life. And I want to encourage us this morning that in living in that abundance, living in that superior life, it's not just at eternity. Jesus meant for us to have a good life here on earth. Jesus meant for us to have an abundant life here on earth. And abundance don't mean riches and wealth and houses and cars. Right? But abundance is just that peace, that joy that we have in him. Knowing that no matter what comes, we have eternal life to look forward to. No matter what comes, we keep our faith steadfast and firm in him. He is our solid rock. He is our foundation. That is an abundant life. Now, living a resurrected life, the manifestation of that abundant life should be evident in all aspects of our lives. If we look at our walk in Christ, because our walk in Christ means that our walk is different from that of the world. We walk with Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We walk with the Almighty. We walk with the Almighty. We walk with the resurrected one. We walk with the King of Kings. The world is lost. And so our walk cannot reflect what the world is, is doing. Right? So there, an abundant life has to be evident in our walk with Christ. An abundant life has to be evident in our marriages, in our relationships. The world's view of marriage nowadays is totally different from that of Christ. The world's view on marriages nowadays is totally different from that of Christ. Nowadays, marriages encompass man and man, woman and woman. Man and man, woman and woman. God ordained it. God created it that marriage is between a man and a woman. Right? So our abundant life have to reflect that in our marriages. Our marriages knowing that we have come together as man and woman. As God has, as, as God has called us and ordained us to be together as man and woman. In one household and one accord. In one flesh as the word says. We have to, that marriage have to represent and reflect Christ. That is what abundance is. People suppose we can look at our marriages, at our relationships and say yes. That is of Christ. That is of God. Amen. In our very parenting, we're going down to the details. In our very parenting, an abundant life has to be evident. Right? The world may raise their kids to, you know, find themselves and explore and just find out what you love and go out there and, and, and be yourself and all sorts. But we as parents raise our children to know Christ. Right? The word says, train up a child in the way that they should grow so that when they're old, they won't depart from it. That, depart from it. that is what we follow as parents. That is what we use as a guide, the Bible itself, to bring up our children. Right? If I can share, even now, with Cardine and myself, with, with Kaylee, like you all see the videos and everything and you all laugh and you find it cute and all of that. But it's like, we, we take it serious, being parents for Christ, right? Or being par parenting Kaylee and Daniel, right? With the love of Christ. Like we take it very seriously. So even at nights before Kaylee goes to bed, before Daniel goes to bed, they have to say a word of prayer. And like I can guarantee you no. If you put Caleb on the spot and say, say your good night prayer, she's going to say it word for word. It might sound cute and it might sound a little muffled, but you're going to get it. Right? That is how we have to raise our children as parents to know Christ. In our finances, in our finances, hallelujah. Some of us are going to hold on to this one. The manifestation of the abundant life has to be evident in our finances. Why? Because God shall supply all our needs according to his riches in glory. We need to know who our source is. 
we need to know who our source is. Our source is Jesus Christ. Our source is the heavenly father. And he owns a thousand cattle upon the land. He owns, he owns, he own, owns this whole kingdom. And we have access to it in the name of Jesus. So we have to bank on that. Sometimes we get lost in just trying to acquire it ourselves. We get lost in trying to go after it ourselves that we leave off Christ. I can attest to that. And sometimes that is why God don't release it to us yet. Sometimes that is why God don't release it to us yet because we are not ready for it. He knows that if he gives it to us, we are going to forget about him. If he gives us the riches, the wealth, which we have access to, we are going to forget about him. And so sometimes God intentionally holds us back, prevents us from gaining access to that. And what we have to do, we just have to focus on getting ourselves ready. Go back to the core. Go back to him. And allow him to bless you with it accordingly. Amen? Amen. So as believers in every dimension of our lives, we should be living abundantly. We should be living superior to, what, to how the world lives. We are his children. We are beyond average. We aren't normal. Because we are his children. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8 says, And if God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So God is able to bless us beyond measure, beyond what we can think or imagine in all things and at all times. But what we have to do is just keep him at the center. Keep him at the forefront in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So a resurrected life, number four. A resurrected life is a life of power. A resurrected life is a life of power. Now power here refers to the ability for things to be manifested through us supernaturally by the works of him who lives in us. Let me say that again. Power refers to the ability for things to be manifested through us supernaturally by the works of him who lives in us. A few weeks ago, we looked at the Holy Spirit and the gifting of the Holy Spirit and how we receive the Holy Spirit when we become believers, when we accept Christ. And receiving the Holy Spirit is basically receiving power. Right? Sometimes we don't see that power manifested as we spoke about. And for those who weren't on, sometimes we don't see power manifested because we don't. We receive the Holy Spirit. That's a given when you become a believer. But then you start to see the manifestation of the fruits of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit when you start to build a relationship with the Holy Spirit. When you start to interact and build intimacy with the Holy Spirit on a day-to-day -day basis. When you start to incorporate him in every aspect of your life. When you seek his leading more than that of others. When you seek his guidance more than that of others. Through the resurrected life, we have power as believers. Like we are a threat to the kingdom of darkness. We are dangerous to the kingdom of God, darkness and the enemy knows that the enemy knows that we have the spirit of God living in us and it is through us that the operation of that same spirit according to Luke 10 verse 19 says that we shall tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm us we are not normal people people of God we are not normal we are not average we are dangerous. We are dangerous and we have to live by that. To tread upon serpents and scorpions. Mighty God. And over all the power of the enemy. And nothing by any means shall harm us. We are God's children. And so for us to operate in the natural here on earth. He has gifted us. The gift of the Holy Spirit. He has given us directly the Holy Spirit. For the Holy Spirit to give us power. Hallelujah. Do not take that lightly. Ephesians 1 verses 18 to 20 says. I pray that the eyes of your heart. 
may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Mighty God. God is saying that that very same power that you have in yourself, that we have in us as believers, is equivalent. The word says, and on me say it, the word says that it is the same power as the mighty strength God himself exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. That is the power that we have in us as believers. That is the power that we walk with. That is the power that we move with. With that power, healing takes place. With that power, miracles take place. We just have to make ourselves for God to work on that power in us. And do those miracles, do those healings, do those miraculous works through us. Hallelujah. That is the power that we walk with. The same power equivalent to the strength that God exerted in raising Christ from the dead. Amen and amen. A resurrected life is a life of power. So we have a resurrected life as we highlighted being a life of freedom, a life of faith, a life of abundance, and a life of power. Last and probably most importantly, a resurrected life is a life of love. A resurrected life, hallelujah, is a life of love. Matthew 22 verses 37 to 40 tells us that Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Living a resurrected life is living a life of love. In this passage of scripture, God highlights the two most important things right are in the list of commandments. The top two. First, we love him with all our hearts, all our minds, and all our souls. And then second, we love our enemy, or love our neighbor, sorry, just as yourself. And we're supposed to love our enemy too, right? So, love God. That is the first and greatest commandment. And then love the, your neighbor just as how you love yourself. The word itself tells us that these are the two great commandments. Right now, Jesus dying for us was an act of love in itself. We can't go around that. Not, not any anybody would do that. And again, nobody can do that again. It has been done already and it has been done perfectly. That was an act of love in itself. Romans 8, 5 verse 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us. In this, that while we were sinners, he died for us. This is our core. This is what we stand on. This is what we believe in. So how can we experience this level of love? How can we receive this level of love? And not exert it to others. Not share it with others. Not show it to others. We can't be living a life of malice we can't be living a life of hatred we can't be living a life of unforgiveness when we ourselves have received the merciful the gracious love the unconditional love of jesus christ that he died for us now the bible says that you should have faith like a child right you should have faith faith childlike faith sorry the Bible says that we should have childlike faith. Now, I believe that we should honestly have childlike love. Like, seriously, childlike love is the biggest thing. Like, when I observe Kaylee and how she loves, how she shows her love, like, if we can get back to that as adults, as big people, as Christians, as believers, if we can get back to that, the world would be a perfect place. <laughs> I kid you not. The world would be a perfect place. Like children, they don't discriminate, they don't judge, they don't hold things against you. Like when I discipline Kaylee, when I tell Kaylee to go in the naughty corner, right? Or I put her on timeout for five minutes and she goes stand up in another corner and she ball and she go on and no matter how no see her, you know, she give trouble when she ready, you know. Don't think say <laughs> don't think say it's all roses, right? 
and laughter and fun, right? She give her trouble when she's ready. And when she does that, we put in a principle that the way that we punish her, the way that we, we let her know that she's doing wrong is that we put her in the naughty corner and she stands there and she cry and she beg and she plead. Yes, yeah, she's just two year old, but she know how to beg. Right? She know if you say please, right? And she beg and she plead to come out of the naughty corner. Right? And even with that, you would think that after myself or Cardine has put her in that place, right, of agony of pain, <laughs> she would come out being upset with us. And I tell you, the minute we say time is up, she leave it alone and she move from the place and she hug we and she kiss we and she tell we say we love we. And all. So that's the kind of love we need to display as believers. We don't hold anything against nobody. Right? Once we have the love of Jesus Christ in us, that is what we're supposed to show. That is how we're supposed to live. Rev. Cardian was telling me about a story when um, she took Kaylee to a fashion store to get some clothes for her. And uh, while they were walking into the store, this police van pulled up. And in the back of the pickup, it was a pickup. In the back of it was a gringo, like one of them hardcore men that were just like him, just get scooped up off of the road, right? Like head twist up, like you can't see, say, look, him get some trouble, right? And he was in the back of the police van, handcuffed and everything. And Cardina walking with Kaylee, pass the van, directly pass the van, and Cardina try to keep a straight and narrow focus because she don't want to make no eye contact <laughs> with the man in the back of the truck. Right? <laughs> and while she's walking past, that is Kaylee there. Hi. Hi. How are you? Right? That is Kaylee waving down the man. And Cardi said, when she look around, she saw a smile on the man's face. She saw a smile on the man's face. That is probably the first in a long while someone was kind to him. That was probably the first in a long while someone showed love to him. So that's what I mean when I say that. We have to get like a child, a childlike love. Because they don't hold anything. The innocence is there. Right? They don't keep unforgiveness in their heart. As soon as something wrong is done, they just move on and love again. And I'm telling you, that is the love of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Whenever we hurt him, whenever we hurt him, all we have to do is go back and say, I am sorry, I repent. And he welcomes us with open arms, showing us that unconditional love. And as we all know, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13 says, And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. We all know it. Let us live by it. In Jesus' name, amen. So those are the five points of what a resurrected life is. As true believers, as children of God, living a resurrected life is living a life of freedom. Living a resurrected life is living a life of faith. Living a resurrected life is living a life of abundance, a life of power. And living a resurrected life is living a life of love. Now, whenever... whenever our lives aren't reflecting these. It's evidence that we're not living a, a life of resurrection. It's evidence that we're not living in the power of his re resurrection. Now, this is the beauty about it. God gives us a choice. God gives us a choice. We can live according to his will. We can live in the power of his resurrection. We can live just as how he taught us to live. Or we can choose to live on our own terms. We have the choice. Right? But if we choose to live on our own terms, we are basically saying to Jesus Christ that what you did was not enough. If we know the word and know the power of his resurrection and have access to that power, have access to that salvation, have access to walk in that resurrection and choose to go the other way, we are basically saying, God, what you did the price that you did, the fact that you sent your son Jesus Christ to die and, raise on the, and rose on the third day is not enough. And I'm encouraging you this morning that as believers, what he did is enough.